today we're pretty lucky. We've got a, a, a BOGO event going on, a buy one, get one. We've got uh, Sharon Guinup on. Um, she's an award-winning uh, investigative journalist, author, photographer. Uh, she's also a um, Wilson Center Global Fellow. And she's covered environmental issues for New York Times, Nat Geo, Scientific America, and really too many others to list. But also joining us uh, is her partner in crime and life, uh, Steve Winter. If you're in the photographer, photography field, then you probably know his name. He is a conservation photojournalist, contributing photographer to Nat Geo, and really just uh, sort of a legend in the field. So thank you so much, both of you, for taking the time to talk with us. Uh, we're, we're pretty excited about getting your insights. Well, thank you for the invitation. Right, thanks for having us. So Good to I, be here. Yeah, <laughs> virtually. Um, I just want to just give us a little uh, background on on you two, on how you got into uh, sort of this subject matter, being this being you know uh, conservation in particular, big cats or you know the illegal wild uh, wildlife trade. Shall I go first? Sure, please. Okay, so. Um, I was a photographer. I went to graduate school and studied both science uh, and, and environment and journalism and started covering environmental issues of all kinds, including you know, wildlife ecosystems, natural history. And certainly if you're going to cover those topics, wildlife trade you know, has become you know, a larger and larger you know, threat to you know, thousands of species across the globe. So, you know, in, in covering, you know, wildlife, that's, you know, kind of where, where it went. Um, and, you know, it's been really fascinating the last couple of years to expand my skills into investigative journalism, which was not my background. Um, and, you know, we, I'll talk a little bit more later about the story that launched that. And then, you know, Steve and my um, most recent story um, both of those were on tigers, just as a teaser. One is the Tiger Temple, and the second is Tigers in the United States. But Steve, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, hi, I'm Steve Winter. Uh, yeah, I started out as a photojournalist. I wanted to be a Nat Geo photographer since I was eight years old. But never in a million years did I ever think I would be doing animals. It never entered my mind. As a kid, even though you turn the pages of the magazine and see animal stories, I never thought of it. So I kind of, you know, morphed naturally into animals, environment, wildlife. And it was really good that I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> because I was used to telling stories. So that's how I uh, approached animals or a wildlife story and quickly realized that I needed to tell the story and wasn't going to have any impact with animals that were rapidly disappearing by just taking pretty pictures of them. That when I did my first big cat story, the first ever Jaguar story, and I went to Brazil after failing for 18 months with trying to get Jaguars in the jungle when I saw that all the cowboys down there were, would shoot every jaguar they saw, that I nat naturally moved towards trying to find an answer to that because I came from uh, NGOs and, and answer uh, evolved journalism or solution journalism as we may say now. And I started working with scientists that I said, hey, do you know all these people are killing the animals you're studying? And why would you spend a couple of years working on a species, only watch somebody kill them for a reason that was without merit? So we started a scientific project. Most people said, why are you doing this? Uh, I quickly found out why, and off we went. So what, Steve, just, just to give a little insight there into you know, how – uh, we journalists can make a, a difference, and photo, photo journalists, photo journalists, one category. Right. Um, you know, Steve, um, working with scientists, they they found that by GPS radio collaring these cats, they could see where they were, and you know, 
if a, a, a cow was killed one night and a rancher was saying, oh, it's that jaguar, and the GPS collars showed that they were nowhere near, you know, it kind of made them, you know, rethink um, this. And Steve showed that you could see jaguars in the Brazilian Pantanal, the world's largest inland wetlands, and it launched um, an ecotourism industry. And now the cats are on the rise. Ranchers don't kill them very often anymore because they're they're worth ecotourism dollars that you know it, it's more money than they were making ranching so you know i think an important you know issue in conservation in general is um making conservation beneficial for the people that have to live with large or dangerous animals so yeah i always say local people need to benefit from living with predators but i had no idea just having two pictures of jaguars in this area that nobody knew about uh would spark this ecotourism industry and ranchers were making more money from ecotourism and now a study was just done that showed each jaguar brings in about a hundred and ten thousand dollars every single year in ecotourism uh money when each cat is only worth two thousand bucks in its whole life cow at least you said cow oh you know it's supposed to be each, yeah a cow each is cow. only worth two thousand yeah. dollars so everybody has a family member involved in this you know ecotourism whether they're guides or work in the lodges or whatever so they're protected and that was a great thing to see in this profession, one thing leads to another. One story leads to the next. We learn, yeah. you know, new things in each story that that we do, and then we often, you know, meet people that, you know, bring us to to the next thing that we're working on. Yeah, and that sort of leads into the next question about sort of uh, we spoke about it briefly uh, earlier this week, but the the sort of that story that became the catalyst for the sort of highlighting the issues in the global wildlife trade. Sharon, you alluded to it about the, about the turtles. So um, right after I switched careers and, and started writing, um, I heard that there was something that was being dubbed the Asian turtle crisis happening in Asia. And this was around 2003. Um, you know, China's economic engines were really driving, you know, giving a lot more spending power to um, many, many more people. And um, turtles were disappearing off the con continent, literally being vacuumed off the continent because um, a turtle dinner um, had once been a specialty thing, a, you know, a birthday, a, a special occasion, and suddenly people had a lot more money to spend and were eating turtle all the time. And with China's large population and, you know, this, there being a much larger middle class, um, it, within about three years time, turtles just disappeared. And, and then, you know, since then, turtles have um, started disappearing from Africa um, red-eared slider turtles are exported from the U.S. to China. They're not endangered, um, and I believe they're bred. But um, that was my first um, real awareness of the way supply and demand um, sparks and changes uh, illegal trade in wildlife. And, you know, what the impact can be of illegal wildlife trade over a really short period if there's a big spike in demand. So what's the kind of the value of the illegal wildlife trade globally? And is it increasing or what, which way is it trending up or down? You know, it's really hard to say because it's an illegal trade. You know, the United Nations, um, you know, estimates have been around $19 billion a year. Um, and that excludes illegal fishing. So that's, you know, and then there's also the illegal timber and plants. I mean, there's other, you know, illegal natural products and fish trade that, you know, add to that. Um, you know, since this is run by international cartels, you know, it's not just little cottage industries poaching as, as it seems to often be portrayed. This is, um, you know, international organized crime at work. 
It's the same uh, organizations that traffic guns, uh, run drugs, you know, run human trafficking operations. They use the same trade routes. Um, this is a, a global trade and it affects every single country on earth. And as a result, um, many, many countries around the world, including the United States and Canada, have recognized illegal wildlife trade as a national security issue. And UN agencies of many, many, um, in many areas, including, you know, drugs and crime, et cetera, um, have started to address this and international enforcement agencies like Interpol. So this is not a small thing. I mean, it breeds corruption. It, it funds um, cartels. It funds some terrorist groups. The Lord's Resistance Army, for example, is funded through Ivory, uh, John Jaweed, uh, you know, also in Africa. So, you know, th this is a very serious issue for many, many, many reasons. It's, it's not only loss of species, it's impact to ecosystems, um, it's corruption, it's, um, th there's a, a whole cascading uh, group of impacts from wildlife trade that people don't tend to think about. And where's, where is the demand and why is the demand there? Well, the demand comes from many different areas, but you know, you could say that in many instances, we're always pointing the finger at Chinese traditional medicine or Asian traditional medicine that has a, a real, its roots in culture. Um, but uh, I think in many instances, this trade has moved from the aspects of health, i.e. the medicine part of that uh, explanation to wealth, you know, uh, because tiger bone, as we know, and parts of the tiger have been off the list of Chinese traditional medicine for over 40 years. Rhino horn has no medicinal value. And you can go on and on and on. So this becomes a luxury product not a health product. So it's moved from health to wealth. And it's mostly the wealthy in China are using tiger products and other things as status symbols. So you think of there's a very small part, but a very small part of 1.4 billion people is still a lot of people. And in other countries, there are uh, uh, markets for this also. So, you know, the best thing we've seen, or one of the best things is if you to try to stop or curtail the demand with the next generation. I, I have a few things to add as sure. well. I mean, China is by far the largest consumer of illegal wildlife products and also legal wildlife trade, yeah. you know, as regulated through the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, which is an international treaty regulating that trade signed by 183 nations. Um, you know, I think particularly now with, with COVID and the recognition of pandemics and pathogens shift around the world, I think we also need to be taking a closer look at legal wildlife trade. And again, putting together species from around the world that can then, you know, mix microbes, mix germs, and who knows what happens. Um, but few people realize that the United States is the second largest consumer of illegal wildlife products. And you know, a lot of people are shocked by that. It's a, it's a much lower number than China and it's for very different reasons. Here it's largely the pet trade or tourist trinkets or leather products. You know, it's not um, wildlife that's being consumed. Um, you know, it's not ivory, it's not pangolin scales, it's not tiger skins. Um, but then there's countries around the world that you know, um, eat bushmeat for example, and many of those are endangered species. So, you know, it's not like uh, consumption is uh, limited to only a couple of countries. This is a, a global issue and it re requires um, global solutions. So in the US, it's kind of more experiential rather than um, consumption or material. Yeah, I mean, even, you know, tourists that like 
go on a cruise to the Caribbean. You know, they may be buying like a lovely conch shell to put in their house. Well, conch is endangered. You know, it's a beautiful shell, but you know, it was probably pulled from the ocean when it still had a live animal in it. And, you know, or there's some lovely turtle feather product. feather earrings or yeah, turtle shell, you know, jewelry. I mean, there's, um, there's many, many different products that people may not even know that they're, you know, contributing to, you know, the uh, extinction of an endangered species. So I think it's very, very important to really um, think about the way we consume, you know, anything that's animal or plant related um, in many of them. Yeah, um, sort of setting aside the, the US or North American uh, part of the trade and looking at, let's say the you know, the Asian markets or um, those that are used for medicinal purposes. Um, how does one even get their hands on, let's say, a pangolin from the African continent and then getting it to Asia? Sort of, can you go through sort of the, the network that happens to get that animal to the, to, to the end consumer? Well, depending on, on the species. Um, you know, their locals are usually engaged in one way or another, either, you know, helping to, you know, find wildlife, actually poaching wildlife, um, helping make arrangements with, you know, local authorities to be able to cross borders, um, again, involving corruption. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's the same international trade routes for many other illegal products. And, um, and then, which involves middlemen and anything that illegal trade would would uh, would use to pass, uh, you know, illegal products across international borders. Many of it, it um, many products are trafficked up via airplane, FedEx. You know, some it's on the back of a you know motorbike. It could be you know stuffed under a bus or hidden in a car wheel wheel well. Or you know, there's been stories of of, of um, people you know, smuggling baby birds like on their body, like, you know, in plastic attached to their bodies or, uh, you know, you name it, you know, tiger cubs in suitcases. I mean, there's many, many ways to smuggle. Um, but then, you know, once they reach their final destination, that's where the prices really hike and, and that's where they bring in the most money. But it comes from many uh, countries around the world and within those countries, you'll have someone from the country, let's say if it's going through Thailand or directly to China, someone will be there that is from that country that has connections with the government because the, it, everything that we've seen, specifically in Africa, there's always a connection with someone. It has to be. That yeah. gets it out. Uh, and specifically if the country happens to have infrastructure projects, money coming in, workers in that country, it's much easier to get products out to the host country. And that, that's a really important point. Like because we, we've we, seen it a we lot were now. recently, like I think it was two years ago, we were looking at uh, Jaguar trafficking and poaching, which is on the rise in South America. And um, it's really spiking in in Bolivia and across the border in Brazil and and in there's there, and there's and in Peru uh, there's a, a large um, Chinese presence now with with infrastructure especially in Bolivia and um, also when we were in South Africa there was a lot of mining going on with Chinese companies and and an awful lot of wildlife is kind of smuggled out even through those kinds of channels so um, you know, we it, went into markets and saw all kinds of stuff, you know, yeah. and there's a way to Jaguar skins, out. Jaguar skulls in, in, in markets in Iquitos, Peru. And the, the bad thing about that aspect was, and I've seen it with tigers also, is the skins in many instances do not have a value because they're too hard to move. Mm -hmm. Many of these other things can be like bones and teeth boiled down into a paste and shipped a certain way and, and mislabeled. And nobody's getting, they look at it and they go, well, what is it? And they just read the label, oh, gone. Uh, and but it's that, hard getting, getting yeah. skins out because of the, the limited value of them. That, that's another issue. Um, you know, there, there's been many massive pangolin 
uh, meat busts, right? Um, you know, you wonder how, how can there be like 10,000 pounds of, of pangolin in one bust? How many? Well, yeah, I saw a, a video of like, they had like a, one of those um, like sea shipping containers. Right. They really opened the doors and it poured out. You're like and, you can only imagine how many pangolins it would take to fill that thing. An extraordinary number of animals, but you know those the um, they're falsified shipping labels, and they often may be you know packed behind like a bit a veneer of fish and claimed as a you know a, a fish shipment, right? So that's just an, another way, and that's uh, shipping containers are another huge um, route, another another mechanism that goes largely undetected just because of the sheer volume. Not There's everything can of be inspected. Of them. When I was in Sumatra doing the Sumatran Tiger, the uh, bus came about and they had two shipping containers full of pangolins. And I saw the pictures and it's just mind blowing and so sad. So it sounds like globalization and sort of like the, the rise in global trade is also right. playing a huge role. Huge role. Well, along with you know, it's also supply and demand. And, and so many of these products are worth so much money. So That's why we need to deal with the demand because in the medicinal aspect of it, I will say that young people that grew up going to a pharmacy in Shanghai or wherever in China, they, they, they're not interested in ingesting endangered species. You know, they want to go to the pharmacist with their prescription, just like we do, and do that. You know, in many instances, as we well know, herbs are very important to Chinese medicine and to other medicines all around the world because they work. But ingesting rhino horn or part of a uh, product that comes from a tiger to try to get its strength has no medicinal value. I always say, if you ate a cheeseburger, do you feel like a cow afterwards? <laughs> no. Yeah, so, so why I would you think the same thing about ingesting a tiger to get its strength? Right. And that's where a lot of this comes from. But you see young people that are jumping on this bandwagon of saving our planet, saving endangered species, and are not going to be part of the demand aspect of it. So there is hope. There's, there's also some really wonderful initiatives by Wild Aid, the International yeah. Fund for Animal Welfare. They produce these like Hollywood level productions, PSAs, with um, famous actors, with you know pop stars, with um, prominent businessmen that are you know campaigning against um, ingesting or buying you know. Uh, shark fin soup, shark fin soup, you know, tiger rhino. products, um, elephant ivory, rhino, you know, people like Yao Ming, Jackie and Chan, Jackie Chan, and um, and <laughs> you know, they, they've they've done like text message campaigns and billboards and and um, you know, notices in in airports and um, you know, you those the airplane, those yeah. education campaigns have have gone a long way towards educating the public. So I you know I think. That's really, really important, especially in terms of the next generation, as Steve yeah. mentioned. So what I really think the demand is going down, uh, particularly for the next generation. Well, I think that the, the demand is dropping for those specific things because we have seen... Shark fin soup, yes. Right, the, the, a drop in them because of what Yao Ming started, and then he moved towards ivory and was a big part of the, the, the band because now he's part of the government. He used to play for the Houston Rockets and the NBA. And so, yes, you know, there are certain aspects where there is hope and the demand is falling. And it depends. I mean, you know, product to product. Pangolin, I don't think the demand has dropped a whole lot. Right. Um, Jaguars, look at this one. We were that's there. rising. I did the first ever Jaguar story for National Geographic and we were working on the second and a TV show. I never saw this. It was a new market created for the four canines. Then it expanded to the bones. And what it is, is mimicking tiger bone, just mm -hmm. like the lion, can lion hunting, uh, breeding going on in South Africa. Those uh, bones are sold as tiger bones because you can't tell the difference visually. Um, so here's a new market that was created because there's a bunch of Chinese companies in Peru. Bolivia, Brazil, 
and they have an easy access out to ships or airplanes or whatever. And I, we talked to an indigenous person, the, the chief of his village. I asked him where he'd been the first three times we were there. And he says, I've been out jaguar hunting. I said, how often do you jaguar hunt? And he goes, 12 months a year. And this was not that did the not case happen. And, and the reason being that um, you know tigers are endangered. There's on, there's about four thousand left in the wild. There are tiger farms in China, Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam that literally farm tigers for their parts and products. And and at last estimate um, by the Environmental Investigation Agency in London. There's about 6,000 tigers in tiger farms in China, you know, that again, feed that trade. But tigers are the most endangered big cat. So, you know, feeding this high-end um, luxury trade um, requires more animals than, than there are available. So now, you know, lions, jaguars are now feeding into that trade. And I've heard that leopards are, are also now being, being poached for the same reason. And so, so, the... so yeah, what you're saying, yeah, you're, you're, to go back to your question, um, you know, is the demand rising? Is it falling? It really depends product to product. Right. And there has been some great progress and there's been, you know, some situations that are getting worse. So it, it really depends on, on value and demand. So now we're well, coming up with a new product like the Jaguar. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the big things is, now is not so much a product or what's come to i guess as you wrote about it in december sharon um the idea of no longer products but services so the services of you know cub petting and and you know visiting a tiger that's been heavily sedated somewhere in thailand and going to pet it that's a different kind of problem or a different kind of trade so do you want to talk a little bit about the, the buddhist temple that you had uh, you had visited so Steve and I did a, a book together on, on tigers. I wrote the text, it was his pictures. It was, you know, 10 years of his, his photographs uh, working in, in tiger, uh, tiger country. And after that, someone contacted me and told me that she needed a media partner. She'd been investigating a place called the Tiger Temple in Thailand for some years. And she believed that working together, we'd be able to prove that they were shipping tigers into the illegal Asian trade. So we, we worked undercover for a year. At the end, at the end of that period, Steve um, brought in his contacts from Thailand as well, and we went to Thailand. Um, so the Tiger Temple is a Buddhist temple that also uh, doubled as a tiger tourism venue that busloads and busloads of people coming in that could bottle feed, pet, take selfies with cubs, walk nearly adult tigers on leashes. There were adult tigers chained to the ground on really short chains that, you know, just laying there that you could pet and, you know, shoot selfies with. Um, and it was about a $3 million a year tourist industry. Um, at the time that we were there, there were 178 tigers on site and there were bred constantly pumping out cubs. And, um, the woman I was working with, her name is Sybil Foxcroft. She's an Aussie. Uh, she started a nonprofit called Sea for Life. Um, we were able to prove that um, they were, the Tiger Temple was breeding, killing, and selling tigers, you know, into the trade and shipping, you know, cubs into the trade uh, in Asia. And it kicked up such a storm uh, with media and nonprofits that um, the government went in and, and shut it down four months later and confiscated those tigers. Um, so that you, was... When did you that write was, that story, sorry? Huh? When did you publish that story? We, we published it in, at the end of January 2016, and, and it was the very, the very end of May. Um, you know, the, the authorities went in and, and shut it down. And, um, you know, for both Steve and I, that was our introduction into this issue of, of captive wildlife. I certainly had covered, you know, the Chinese tiger farms. I'd never been there and I'd never, 
I'd never worked as an investigative journalist prior to the Tiger Temple story. And then, um, you know, Steve and I continued on, you know, since then. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, we'd never been involved in this tourism aspect. You know, I, I went there first for a few days when I was doing the last Tiger story. And I'd never seen anything like it just because we'd never been around it, you know. I mean, to see people bottle feeding cubs and then walking and taking a big head and putting it in somebody's lap. Of course, they're drug. We, I, you just spent all this time with wild tigers. You know, there's no way you're going to put a giant head of a tiger in somebody's lap. Like, and, and, and that it's this limp off. that you're literally this, right? Yeah. You know, and that's yeah. what I saw a video earlier today uh, on. Jackson Wilde's Instagram of you, Steve, being attacked by a tiger in it as you're yeah. taking pictures of it. That was here in the you US. Amazingly calm. <laughs> well, <laughs> because when I'm in the field, you become face to face with these animals and, and you're scared to death, but you know, fear keeps you alive, and the great local people that I work with give me the uh, confidence I need that they know what they're doing because I don't. So if you want to segue, you know, to, to the U.S., um, you know, that cat, which was a Thai liger, right. a lion-tiger hybrid that was then bred back to a tiger. And these, you know, these animals do not exist in nature. They're strictly bred to bring in tourists. Um, this, that was a cat that had been in the cub petting trade, was cast off, and was taken in by this woman who used to run a sanctuary that was open to the public, but she had her U.S. Department of Agriculture license pulled when one of her workers was killed by one of her animals. Um, she still had a bunch of them. That cat, 280 pound, you right. know what, year and a half old Thai Liger, she walked around the place on a leash. And Steve, of course, was she a, loved this cat. was what? Well, yeah, she was. You know, Steve was photographing it for this Nat Geo story on on captive U.S. tigers that we worked on for two years. And um, you know, you, you squat down to a, to a predator's level, which he wanted eye level photographs, right? And yeah, it charged him. And and he's no, really, I told really him. Lucky. I said, I'm going to get low. It's going to come at me. And they were they looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> Just watch. <laughs> when I did it, it came at me. And then I did it five more times than on the sixth time. But in that video, yeah. you'll notice that, you know, this tiger is charging him. And there's a woman on her cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> She's trying to hold him back with one arm while the other arm is on the phone. Right. <laughs> and, of course, the leash is pulled yeah. I just had to get away because it grabbed my arm first and we heard all these stories about arms being ripped off, arms being bit off. So I lot. turned and yeah. then was moving and then I saw the fence and went, I can't be in between the tiger and the chain link fence. So then I had to move to my right and then she finally got a hold of it and and uh, just, I just turned and saw that our, our son was filming me and that's when I said I just got to keep my bag too. And that's that's one thing I was going to say is that Because you would never do it with a wild animal. Our, our son Nick Ruggia is is a filmmaker and it it shows how warped his childhood was being in the field with us that yeah. you know that was being shot on an iPhone and the tiger is right here. It's so, normal day. And he just kept shooting. Anybody in their right mind would have run <laughs> or gotten away. Uh, got the shot. But, no, no, you yeah. got to get the shot. What's more important? Exactly. Oh, you no, trained no. him well. Yeah. yeah. The shot, the shot, or Dad's arm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I took care of that by moving away. But I, I tell everybody that you didn't see feathers flying. So. Well, that leads I, into the. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts on uh, the Tiger King because kind of big picture, it covers the same topic and the same characters that you guys covered in your December piece, yes. whether it's approached in a very different way. Um, I would say Not so. only in terms of the medium, like yours is written in photography and that was filmed, but in terms of how you talk about the characters. What did you think of the Tiger King and... Why do you think it became such a, a trending um, topic? And a, why, why did it get so much media attention? Well, um, 
I, I did an op-ed for the Washington Post on this, and Steve and I have certainly been you know, discussing it a, a good bit. First and foremost, um, Tiger King was not a documentary, it was reality TV, and it did not focus on, on animals or what that um, tiger cub petting tourism industry is. It focused on um, many eccentric people right. that are involved in that industry. Um, I think some of the the biggest things that, that really need to be put on the table is that first and foremost, it forgot about the tigers. Right. You know, every one of these roadside zoos has been cited for many, many years for really egregious animal abuse. And, you know, the system in the U.S. for inspection and, um, you know, um, regulation of Animal Welfare Act um, standards, which is our national law on on that um it's egregious and the usda is purposefully not doing their job i mean they were doing a bad job before but under the current administration enforcement has dropped by 92 percent and that was something we reported in our story so you know here's this commercial cub petting industry where females are bred constantly cubs are pulled from them the second they're born right. the only you know uh intimation of that was like one clip where Joe Exotic was holding some babies and then there was one clip where they're pulling a, a just born cub out from under its mother with a, a hook just and born. dragging it through a chain link fence right but you know that cub would then be passed around at the age of about four weeks by the time it's 12 to 16 weeks it's ripping people up and they're strong and they they can't be passed around anymore so this requires constant um a constant flow of cubs. Um, it's illegal to sell cubs across state lines to fuel, you know, this industry, um, you know, violates all kinds of national laws, uh, you know, protecting tigers as an endangered species. So there's, there's criminality, there's abuse, there's tax violations. Many, many of the people involved in this, this uh, industry have criminal backgrounds, including many, many felonies of all kinds, including violent crimes. Um, so I, I could go on for a very long time about that. And I know Steve wants to talk about the purported conservation you know, aspects of that. So we'll let him go into that in a minute. But um, you know, essentially, Tiger King glorified some very eccentric fringe people and did not address um, a very uh, abusive, industry that is essentially unregulated in the u.s without an overall federal law yeah that, that's uh as you mentioned leading into to steve speaking with the conservation because it reminds me of the idea of um farms in in southern africa that are you know raising rhinos so that they can cut the ivory off and sell it in order to sort of curtail what is the illegal killing of rhinos to get diary as well um so many i guess would say because there's what anyway an estimates between five and ten thousand tigers in the u.s um in these roadside zoos um but there's not that many there's not even near that many in the wild so are we protecting the species some would say we're protecting the species by keeping uh, the keeping the species alive let's say as opposed to going extinct no, because in the end, you, you, uh, none of these tigers in the U.S. has any conservation value, uh, mostly because they're all mutts. You know, they're all a mixture of many different kinds of tigers. There's, there's five subspecies, subspecies still in the wild, right. and then there is a sixth that exists essentially just in captivity in China. Right. So South these are China. mutt tigers. They're right. crossbreeds. Right. And, you know, they're... But I, I think the bottom line, everybody needs to know when you go in one of these places, even at GW and Winniewood, it talks about conservation. Which is Joe's, Winniewood yeah, is Joe's, Joe's formerly place. place. You go to Doc Antles in Myrtle Beach, it has conservation up inside, conservation outside. No, because there never has been a captive bred tiger successfully released in the wild. There, you can't even release wild born 
tigers that have not been taught to hunt by their mother back into the wild because I was there when they tried it, you know, months they were in an enclosure. I even came home and went back to India and then find out when they released them, they immediately went towards the village to eat cows or goats. And then all the people that are there are with animals that aren't afraid of them because they've seen people throw roadkill over the fence to feed them since they were young. So in this instance, so they might kill the pe villagers also, which happens way too often. In this instance that Steve is is um, discussing, you know, there was two mothers that were killed. Right. One one by a revenge killing for having eaten a buffalo. A buffalo. Which so is really bad. You know, the the farmer poisoned the carcass. The second one was run over and and left orphan cubs. So five of them. So you know, the park rangers tried putting these cubs in an enclosure in the center of the park limiting human contact, just throwing them food, and then letting them go when, when they were old enough, it went straight to a village. I mean, if, if tigers are habituated to humans, they're going to come to human settlements and then either kill livestock or endanger people. So, you know, that's, that's a basic thing. But the other thing is that captive tigers in the U.S., captive tigers in Thailand, in China, you know, anyway. they're not only, you know, crossbred, they're heavily inbred. They have very serious health problems. They've been pulled from their mother at birth and, and fed badly, so they have skeletal and other, you know, developmental problems. These are very unhealthy cats. And um, every one of these roadside zoos you go to in the U.S., and we went to a lot of them, yeah. believe me. I think Steve traveled to about 30 states. I think I was in 20 states. We, we really, like, we hit the road and really visited these places. Um, every one of them claims that, you know, by people coming there and spending their money, they're contributing to conservation, and it's really not true. And meanwhile, people leave feeling like they've done a good thing, and they post their selfies and you know, walk out happy. And uh, I think it's really important for people to understand um, this really dark underbelly to any kind of hands-on wildlife tourism attraction. Why do you think it is people are naive to it? Because just before you jumped on, me and Joe were talking about it and people who I went to school with, who I grew up with, and you think you all share this kind of same awareness of um, conservation, even as like people who aren't experts in conservation. You, you have this understanding of, you know, don't touch wild tigers. And if they're in captivity, uh, a temple in Thailand, they're probably drugged. And when I was growing up, I'd see like friends who go to these temples in, Chi in Thailand and get their selfies with the tigers. Why do you think the average person is so happy to do that? And not, because to me, it doesn't take a lot of like, cognition to realize that these animals, this isn't natural, these animals are probably drugged. I would say two things. Yeah. One, one is that I think, you know, I know as, as, as an American, you know, our, our culture does not have a, a great deal of awareness of, of the natural world. So I think just off the bat, people aren't used to making that jump. The other thing is that a tiger cub is adorable. Even you know, the people if really against you don't, it say. If you don't you know. know better, I mean, holding a gorgeous tiger cub, of course it's it's a thrilling experience. So Y'all love kittens. You know, if you don't, <laughs> baby animals, right? Puppies, yeah, right. whatever. So if you don't know that it's bad, and if you're being told by these venues that by, right. by paying for this, and some of them are expensive, Myrtle Beach Tiger Safari, Doc Antle's place, Doc was in Tiger King. His place, it's between, I think, $4.92 and $6.92 a person for their, their Saturday morning Tiger Safari. And it is beautiful. All you see, it's high end, it's gorgeous. You don't see anything ugly. And, and it's a number of no hours cages. exhilarating experience for people. And you would not know that breeding and dumping tigers when they're too big to pet. You know, there's, we found examples of them being killed, just, you know, sick, you know, the, the whole background, unless you knew that, um, you would think that you were doing something good. You're contributing to conservation, but yeah, tigers are really cute. So there, is there a such thing as like a, a good zoo to go to or, you know, 
a good well, like what places are good for this kind of well, you I, take this yeah i think in the end you need to make a distinction between the roadside zoos that like winnie wood and the things you saw in tiger king and real sanctuaries and you also need to realize that one would not exist without the other the sanctuaries wouldn't be there if there weren't all these surplus cats because of all this breeding for cubs you know so sanctuary has no human contact with tourists there's no touching of of animals once they take the animal, but let, let, let's differentiate life. wildlife. Right. You know, it's not like a petting zoo where you're petting a goat, right. a domesticated right. animal, but we no hands on contact with the wildlife. Right? So they rescue these animals from these roadside zoos. And one of the, the opener of the story with the three tigers with the rainbow and the two in the stock tank, they came from Joe Exotic. He actually called the sanctuary up in Colorado, the wild animal sanctuary and said, I have all these surplus tigers. And the guy was surprised that Joe would call, but he needed cage space. At least he didn't shoot them like he did the five that he was convicted of. But so you have no contact by the tourists. When they take the animal, they take him for life. They have great vet care, good food, because a lot of these things are lacking. We heard way too often, as far as vet care goes, a 10 cent bullet is cheaper than a $200 vet bill. You know, you have to look at the life cycle of these animals, especially when they're cubs and they're taken away from their mother. So they're lacking that nutrition that they would get being with mom, not even thinking about that emotional bond because we're looking them at, at these tigers as objects, as things that were demeaning them, you know. But again, one, one important uh, distinction, um, you know, I think if people want to know what a good place is or a bad place right. is, right? If and there's hands-on contact with wildlife, there's no something good. ugly going on in the background. And if they're breeding, if there's baby animals that maybe, maybe there was a rescue of a pregnant tigress once in a blue moon, but if they have baby animals, then it's not a sanctuary. If they're breeding, they're not, they're not a sanctuary. And um, again, just about every one of the roadside zoos that we visited, not only claimed to be, you know, con conservation oriented, right. but they were sanctuaries and they were rescues and they were refuges. And, and you know, again, that's simply not true. Um, of the five to 10,000 tigers that are in the US, um, just under 300 of them are in like uh, AZA accredited right. zoos, like the big zoos, the San Diego Zoo. You know, those do not allow hands-on contact um, you know, and, and those are purebred tigers. It's fine to go to a, a zoo. I mean, the zoos exist. They're there, right? The animals exist. You know, I, I think yeah. the discussion about, you know, zoos is, is a much deeper discussion right. that, I, you know, not, it's too deep to go into right now. But there's the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries that accredits true sanctuaries. Right. Um, you know, there's others that aren't didn't bother to do that accreditation, but they are true sanctuaries. Um, and they need visitors, you know, how do they, you know, pay to feed their cats? It costs 10 grand a year to feed and give vet care to one tiger. So yeah, absolutely. To support sanctuaries or go to a zoo, there's nothing wrong with it, but just really do your research. You can see the names of some of them in the article and the captions on the pictures too. But, you know, there, there's a couple of great ones that I went to, the Wild Animal Sanctuary in Colorado, uh, Turpentine Creek in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, Lions, Tigers, and Bears in Alpine, California. But they're all you know, on that yeah. uh, Global Federation of Animals. But there's Sanctuary. not that many. But it's the problem 20 is 20 or under. so many of these roadside zoos have sanctuary in their name. So, yeah. So you really have to do your work. Yeah. So on, on that note, what about the big cat rescue, which was featured heavily in Tiger King as kind of a central part to the storyline they were developing? Uh, well, you know, have you they, been there and what are your thoughts on that? Yes. And, and uh, you know, spoken to both Carol Baskin and Howard Baskin extensively over the years we were, 
you know, doing this investigation, and we've we've been there a number of times. Um, Big Cat Rescue is a true sanctuary. All the criteria that we noted, um, you know, Tiger King wanted to to play um, yeah. Carol and Joe off of each other and and make them seem equal. Um, and and you know, alleging that Carol killed her husband who disappeared twenty. 23 years ago, no one was ever charged. Um, Big Cat Rescue has um, been uh, a very strong force in trying to get legislation enacted in the US that would address um, ownership of big cats. We do not have an overarching federal law. It's it's a patchwork of state regulations. And in some states, None you, at all. You, can, you could get a cub put it in some flimsy enclosure in your backyard. You wouldn't need any permits. No one would even know you had it. Was it four um, states in, in the article? It's, four, it's yeah. four states, yeah. And then other states that you know may require the equivalent of a dog license. It may change county to county. Um, so there has been legislation introduced uh, into both the US Senate and the House of Representatives called the Big Cat Public Safety Act that would um, nationalize uh, uh, regulations that make it illegal to own a, a cat, big cat, as a pet, and it would also um, make cub handling illegal. Right. And that would essentially take care of this kind of roadside zoo uh, breeding breeding yeah. issue. Yeah. If, if there was no cub petting, then that's the end of that industry. Because the bottom line is it's all about money. You know, this is and not about money. You got to strip out the conservation and everything because that doesn't exist. It's all about big money. The one we spent a day at 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 Myrtle Beach Tiger Safari, Doc Antle's place, and did a very conservative estimate of what they made. We needed model releases very from everyone, so I know how many people were there. Um, I estimated at the lowest cost, not the highest cost, which could have been up to $200 per person higher. So with this morning safari, middle of the day, there was uh, someone who paid for a private $5,000 swim with a tiger experience. And then there was a night safari. The lowest estimate of what that brought in in a day's receipts was 50 grand, it's $50,000. In one day. So you know, we're talking serious money here. And remember, that's a low ball estimate. Right. It is funny that you said almost unequivocally that the Big Cat Rescue is a sanctuary, though, because as you said, on the on the Tiger King, it was made out to, or to me even, it seemed that, yeah, they're, they're basically yeah. running the same thing. They just have a different marketing scheme. So, yeah. so one thing I want to note there, there was that footage that they kept running of like massive lines of people and masses of people. That was from a one day fundraising event. That's not what the place looks like every day. On a given day, there might be a tour with like six people being led around the zoo, but they made it seem like that's what, what it was. It was like this, you know, massive uh, tourist attraction. Um, so, Which you'll see at Winniewood now. I if think you it was go a, online, it opened two weeks ago. Doc is open. They are packed. Yeah, they 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 got big tourist boots boosts from cub from petting, this. Cub selfies, um, you, you know, know, Joe Exotic's place and Doc Antle's place. Couple people and, with masks on. Everybody else just sitting around with tiger <laughs> cubs. And, so, do you think yeah. it's caused more damage than it has solved by glamorizing these eccentric characters? I, I think there's two things, right? I mean. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you look at these pictures of, of people jamming, you know, right. uh, Joe Exotic's former zoo that is now run by Jeff Lowe and is, is doing exactly the same thing short of the murder for hire charges. You know, they are, you know, breeding, you know, cub petting, selling, uh, and then disposing of, of, of cubs in, in that cycle because that's what the industry is. Um, but um, it's also offered an opportunity for many more people to find out that this is going on. I mean, discussions like we're having right here today, right? Um, and, you know, I think particularly now, um, as we're amidst a global pandemic that originated from 
wildlife trade, it is a moment to think about, you know, how, how do we deal with wildlife? You know, how do we consume wildlife? You know, how do we, um, how do we influence ecosystems? I mean, what, what do we do as humans, you know, to the planet that we share with, yeah. you know, billions of other organisms, you know, that are not only really damaging the planet, but also come back to impact us. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to kind of, especially put that idea on the table for people to think about at a time where we all have to sit back and think. We're being forced, you know, into different kinds of isolation and, you know, for that reason, because of what we've done. Well, thank you. I think that's a great place to, uh, to wrap it up. Is there anything that you would like to plug anything you'd like to let us know is coming up any articles coming out or or shows not right now everything's kind of been put on hold um one thing i i, I would like to mention before we go uh, you know people always ask you know what they can do to help yeah so um first and foremost if you're going to go to you know an animal attraction do your research but also if you'd like to really contribute to conservation, um, again, do your research. I think a lot of people are just, um, they see a, a big name conservation organization, they just give money. You know, if there's a certain species that you care about, like do, do research and see maybe what are the grassroots on the ground organization that's really making a difference for uh, a species. Um, for tigers, the Wildlife Protection Society of India has done more to um, save tigers um, in, in an enforcement um, right. realm, you know, tracking uh, wildlife crime and, and, and preventing poachers from killing and catching poachers and, and helping, you know, police put them behind bars. The Environmental Investigation Agency, which is based in London, again, incredible research um you know there's there's initiatives that are making a difference and and you know there's one called save vietnam's wildlife that's doing a great work with pangolins for example um so you know look around and see if there's you know an organization that you see really making a difference and and contribute there and for people that you know want to learn more about uh, the U.S. laws and and may want to um, you know discuss it with their representatives. The Big Cat Public Safety Act you know has not yet been voted on. It's um, it has more than enough sponsors in the House. It hasn't yet gone up for a vote. It has less sponsors in the Senate, um, but um, that's that's something that people may want to look into. Um, we can all make a difference. Every one of us. Um, look at Greta, right? Yeah. Um, I think every one of us can can step in, speak up, contribute in one way or another, and and um, I I hope that um, I hope that we can inspire each other to do so. And I think we really need to look at our planet differently, especially right now, that to understand that the health of ecosystems, the health of animals, and us as humans are all linked. And the planet in which we live gives us life. And nature is perfection. And so start thinking of it that way. And you will have a different kind of Tiger King. And you'll look to actually at the tigers themselves. 